Welcome to Good Games Spawn Point, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. And I am Darren. Coming up on the show, the high altitude obstacle course madness of vertiginous golf. <laughs> Plus, we have another free game of the week, and Darren, I want you to relax before I say it. Oh, oh. It's called Robocraft. No! Oh, oh, oh. Robocraft! And I have compiled a Darren report on the creator of Pokemon, a man almost as elusive as a Tyrogue or a Feebus. Well, let's get right to it then. Oh, but first, Darren, have you got a trivia question for us? Oh, affirmative. Shake up those brain cells, Spawlings. It's time for Darren's Challenge! <laughs> this week, I'm asking you this. In LEGO Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars, what is the name of the Republic Cruiser Hub where you can buy and spawn hero characters? Answer at the end of the show. Mm, well, we know it's not the Millennium Falcon because that's not a cruiser. That's right. The Falcon's a Corellian freighter, I think. Well, Darren will just have to enlighten us later. Now it's time for the news with Goose. Thanks, guys. Goose here with all the gaming news. There's an exciting competition underway for all students in years 5 to 12 who are interested in making games. The Australian STEM Video Game Challenge, which is now in its second year, asks students to design and build an original video game based on STEM concepts or themes. STEM, of course, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Entries can be from individuals or teams of up to four. If you think you have what it takes to make a game, then you'll need to check out the website here and register before the 19th of June. Nintendo has revealed that it's partnering with Universal Theme Parks to build real-life rides and attractions based on their characters and games. They haven't announced any specific rides yet, but personally I'm hoping for a Mario Kart roller coaster and maybe a Luigi's Mansion haunted house or a Donkey Kong Jungle Cruise. Oh, the possibilities are endless. Well, that's all the news for this week. Back to you guys in the studio. Oh, what about, what about a Mario jumping castle? Because he jumps and... Oh. Okay, guys, it's time to look at our free game of the week, and it's Robocraft. <laughs> okay, Darren, settle down, calm your circuits. Yeah, just try to relax, Darren. There are so many robots. <laughs> Darren, maybe you should just take a minute. Go have a nice, relaxing oil bath, perhaps. Uh, negative. I'm all pew pewed out. For now. <clears throat> uh, Robocraft is an online vehicle based combat game where you design your own robots and take them online to battle in a variety of modes. The vehicle creator is simple but versatile. You just select a type of block from a menu and put it together in any shape that takes your fancy. Then just add on some wheels or jets and a few weapons, of course, and you're good to go. Yeah, it's so easy to use, and I managed to create some pretty effective machines. If I do say so myself, which I do. I basically just crammed on as many weapons as possible. Seems like a pretty good strategy. Well, there's actually a handy practice mode where you can test your designs before taking them online. Can you guess what my robot looks like? Mm, a big cheese sandwich? Oh, a goat. Negative. Behold, the Battle Darren. OK, Darren, that's enough noob destroying for now, I think. Why don't you walk us through the game's upgrades? Oh, of course. <clears throat> Uh, you start off with access to just a small selection of basic blocks and weapons. But as you play, you'll earn experience and tech points to spend on researching more advanced parts and building more complicated robots. Then each robot is assigned to a tier from 1 through 10 based on the complexity and quality of its parts. Yeah, your basic robots are tier one and your larger, scarier robots are higher up the scale. But you'll only ever fight robots at the same tier as you, so you'll never get crushed by vastly superior foes. Mm. Oh, we only played enough to get us up to tier two, so we weren't able to experiment with the really huge robots, and we only could test out two of the modes. Affirmative. The main mode has two teams trying to get across the map and destroy the other team's protanium core. But there's also a classic mode where you only get one life. <laughs> and once you get to tier six, you can unlock a MOBA style mode and a cooperative boss challenge mode. The combat is simple, but it's fun. Watching robots break apart block by block is satisfying. And there's some strategy in aiming to either disable wheels or weapons as quickly as possible. And the main battle mode definitely rewards good teamwork. 
As matches go on, the respawn timers take longer and longer, eventually knocking you out for over a minute. So you really have to try and play smart and safe towards the end of a match and work as a team or things quickly go south. But Darren, here's the big question. Just how free is this game? Almost completely free, Barger. Almost. Uh, there are only a few cosmetic items that you won't be able to obtain through free play, uh, but there is, of course, a premium currency you can purchase to spend on quickly unlocking advanced robots and parts. And there's also a premium membership option which doubles your rewards, but that's it. I liked that for every premium member that plays in a game, everybody else gets a 5% boost to their rewards too. It's just a nice way to balance things out between those who pay and those who don't. Yeah, absolutely. We should point out this game is still in early access, which means it's not quite finished yet. But right now, there are infinite robot possibilities to design and plenty of fun to be had. So it's easily worthy of our free game of the week. All right, make way. It's time for a Darren report. Mm -hmm. Bye, Darren. Bye, Bye, Darren. If we could reconstruct Darren, what would you what would you change about him? Ooh, I think I'd definitely make him more sparkly. Yeah. And um, I would just choose more edible parts. Maybe like mm. gingerbread, bit oh, okay. cheese. Oh wow. Okay, yeah. cool. I'd probably just remove his mouth. Welcome to the Darren Report. Today, I want to tell you about an insect-loving young boy who would grow up to invent a gaming phenomenon, Pokemon. Satoshi Tajiri was born in Tokyo in 1965 and spent most of his childhood searching his garden for insects. He loved collecting them so much his friends called him Dr. Bug. He didn't always spend his time outdoors, however, as he became a fanatic for gaming arcades classic space invaders in particular. Oh, he also loved watching Japanese shows such as Godzilla and Ultraman. When he was a teenager, Tajiri wrote his own arcade gaming fanzine, which he called Game Freak. He then went on to learn the programming language BASIC and start his own game creation company, also called Game Freak, the company behind Pokemon. It took six years to develop the first game, Pokemon Red and Green for the Game Boy handheld, with Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto acting as Tajiri's mentor, guiding him through the process of designing the game. Uh, Tajiri was not a fan of violence in games, and he demanded that Pokemon should never die, only faint. After its release in Japan as Pocket Monsters Red and Green, a special blue edition was released, which became the basis for the Western release and its rename to Pokemon Red and Blue. A special rare Pokemon called Mew was hidden in the game to encourage gamers to trade in the hopes of finding it. Pokemon was a huge success and has even appeared in the Guinness Book of Records as the best-selling RPG of all time! Oh. Tajiri still works tirelessly on the Pokemon games to this day, and for that we salute you, Satoshi Tajiri. Oh. And that's a wrap for the Darren Report. Goodbye. Oh, oh. that reminds me, I've got to catch you all. Well, let's start things off with this one from the ghost of the ABC, who is in Ultimo, uh, inner city CBD in New South Wales. I didn't know there was a ghost of the ABC, Hex, roaming around at night. You haven't seen him? Oh, that's who keeps stealing all of my pens. Yeah. Yeah, that's who it is. <sighs> Hello there, Hex and Barjo. I have three questions that I would like to ask you. One, why are the Legend of Zelda games called The Legend of Zelda? In the games, Zelda's an actual character, isn't she? Not a legend. Two, may you please show me what your daily life working at the ABC is like? Yeah, I know I'm the ghost of the ABC, but honestly, I couldn't be bothered exploring. Three, how do you make the faces for the smileys? Is it just random sounds? Please show me on the following. Um, okay, so this is how we do them. Woo! Blue! Thanks. Sincerely, the ghost of the ABC Ultimo. 
Well, Ghosty, I think the word legend applies more to the overall game than Zelda's specific character. So the overarching story of the games is the legend, and within that legend, Zelda is a pivotal character. Does that make sense? I think it does. As for what our daily life is like here, well, every day of the week is different. We're either sitting at our desks writing reviews, playing games in our games room, or sitting with the editors to make sure our previous week's reviews have come together just right. We also have meetings, and we chat about the games and our ideas before we shoot the reviews, and on Tuesdays and Wednesdays we spend pretty much all day in the studio filming Good Game Spawn Point and our big show, Good Game. Of course, that's just us and Darren. There's also a big team of people behind the scenes involved in all aspects of making the show who have all sorts of different jobs to do every single day. Yeah, like fetching Darren coffee, and he doesn't even drink coffee. He just pours it on the ground <laughs> or on my desk. Just like that. Oh, oh. As for how we make the smileys, it's not just random sounds. It's much of an art as it is a science, really. You consider the shape and the emotion the smiley conveys. Then, through the power of emoticon conversion software, we can analyse the overall waveform of the smiley, which we then interpret for you, to produce an appropriate sound. Wait, really? I, I just make mine up. Yeah, I just made mine up too. Okay, well, let's move on to this one then from Will, who is in Adelaide, South Australia. When you said you could come out near a village by putting Darren is a noob in the seed section, were you joking? Because I can't get it to work. Please, can you help? No, Will, we weren't joking. Every time we used Darren is a noob as a seed, we spawned right next to a village. So it should work for everyone else too. Mm. Maybe where you're going wrong is that you might be using a capital D for Darren. Seeds are case sensitive. So if you write this, you get a different world to when you write this. Admittedly, using a capital letter for the name is the correct thing to do in terms of grammar, but that's not the right thing to do if you want to spawn next to a village. Mm, indeed. <laughs> ah! Bajo speaking. Hello, Bajo. I was just calling to say spawnlings should not use that seed. It's a silly seed. Ah, come on, Darren. It's a great seed. Negative. I've discovered that if they use good game spawn point, with each word capitalised, they will also spawn near a village. They should use that Aww. one. Oh yeah, Darren, but you spawn a bit further away from the village, so I think Darren is a noob is still a much better scene. Negative. I'm afraid so. Negative. Guys, it's guys, too. guys. All right, Darren, um, that, that is a great tip. So, Spawnlings, you can also use Good Game Spawn Point with capital letters for each word as a seed if you want to spawn next to a village and then you don't have to call Darren a noob. Is that better, Darren? No. Oh, perfect. Less accurate. Oh, but Darren is still a noob and it is still a better seed, Negative. in my opinion. Negative. All right, well, maybe we should move on. But uh, while you're here, Darren, we've got some uh, questions for you. So, um, they're from the King of Noobs, who is in uh, Noob... Uh, in Noob Land, which is New South Wales. King of King of Noobs. Is that a friend of yours, Darren? Negative. Are you a member of King of Noobs? Negative. Uh, negative. Parliament? Negative. Do, do no, kings have no, no noobs in my Rolodex. <laughs> negative. Hello, Barjo and Hex. These questions are only for Darren. I got three questions I want to tell you. One, what does we stand for? Two, how do you get the Minecraft jar? It doesn't have it. Three, can Darren please sing the Nyan Cat song because it is awesome? Please answer these questions. Please, P.S. Bajo, do these. And Hex, do these. And Darren, do these. Grumpy. Economic. Star. Thanks for the support. Well, thank you for the questions, your newbie highness. Uh, but we doesn't stand for anything, necessarily, although it does represent certain things. Nintendo largely chose the name because they thought the word we was essentially the same as we, as in you and me. Uh, they believed the word emphasised that the console is for everyone. They also believed that the two dotted lowercase i's symbolised two people playing together as well as the consoles, Wii Remote and Nunchuck controllers. Mm, it's interesting to hear how much thought goes into something like that. So why do you think they went with the Wii U for their current console, Darren? Well, the Wii was hugely successful, so I imagine they wanted to continue using the name to build on its brand awareness. And I guess the U is meant to mean you, because they wanted the console experience to cater to you. Oh, like you as in me. Uh, negative. Uh, the me is me, the you is you. So you mean the me's are me and the we is we, but the you is you? Correct. It's a confusing name. Mm. Many believe the console has actually struggled to sell, partly because people are simply unsure if it's a whole new console or 
Just an add-on. So do you think the next console should be called the Wii U Me? <laughs> I would sincerely hope not. It should be called the Darren. Everyone would want one. Get me a Darren for Christmas, father. <laughs> That's what the children would say. And take it back to the shop. I don't think there's ever going to be a console called Darren, Darren. No, oh, it wouldn't be the Darren, Darren, just the Darren. Although the Darren, Darren does have a nice ring to it. Oh, it sounds like Duran, Duran. Oh, great thinking, Hex. But no, no, I wasn't saying it should be called the Darren, Darren, Darren. I, oh, just, just answer the next question, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, to get the Minecraft jar, you should only need to install Minecraft, open the launcher, and press play. The jar file should download automatically. Mm. Uh, as for singing the Nyan Cat song. Don't do it. <clears throat> Don't do it, Darren. Yeah, okay, we should probably just move on. And we've got this one from Elite Gamer who is in Gamerland, Queensland. Oh, Hex, I've got an email from Darren. Oh, yeah, what is I'm just going to open up as, as an audio file. I'll just forward it to you. Hi, I have two questions. One, what console is I Am Red on? And two, is Scream Ride Violent? Thanks. Well, Elite Gamer, at the moment, I Am Bread is only available for PC and Mac. The developers have also confirmed that they will make an iOS version, though, but we haven't heard anything about any other version. It's obviously designed to work with a controller, so there's no reason it couldn't come to the consoles in the future. They just haven't announced that it will as of now. Hmm. As for if Scream Ride is violent, well, I guess it has a kind of cartoon violence, much like the way the cartoon Roadrunner is violent. Yeah, it's stylized animated violence, and no one actually gets hurt. But if you are worried about it at all, please check with your grown ups before you play it. And on that note, we're out of time for this week, so if you've got a question you'd like to ask us, then you can go here and send it in. <laughs> Why? Why did you do that? <laughs> Alright guys, we've played a lot of sports games in our time, but none that are as difficult to say as vertiginous golf. It's vertiginous golf. <laughs> Roll the tape, Gary, while we find Bajo a dictionary. Vertiginous. Vertiginous. The pigeon. Vertiginous. Pigeons. We cannot lift alone. We cannot carry the burden of the rise of the lowland alone. We, the middlemen, are in the highland. So all we can give is guidance, support, and, dare say, our love. Vertiginous golf is not your typical sports sim. The game literally takes its golfing gameplay sky high. Each hole is constructed on floating platforms with various obstacles, ramps, and pipes to navigate. Ah, that makes sense. Darren, you see, now, vertiginous means something so high it's likely to cause dizziness. So, this is a golf course that could give you vertigo. Ah. Exactly, and there's an unusual steampunk storyline behind this game as well. And here is your update coming all the way from LAND London Audio News Dispatches. Although I can't say that it made much sense, but I did admire its little touches, like the course's lavish carpets and the cute little robotic bird that follows you. It is quite a peculiar story. It turns out the citizens of Scudborough are using these painful-looking virtual reality machines to escape their squalor and be transported into this golf game. Morning. Although even gathering that much from these chatty holograms kept my interpretation diagnostics busy. We have seen an evolution of their previously antediluvian state. Hey guys, hey guys, they should call it the Bose Golf, huh? Huh? You, you know, you could say uh, that their meandering monologues obfuscated the dissemination of elucidated specificity. Wow, you picked up a lot from that dictionary. Yeah, yeah. Speed reading hex. It's one of my myriad of talents. <laughs> uh, not that it helped me with this game, though. These courses are fiendishly designed. So many conveyor belts and ramps sending me the wrong way. Or I just knock it completely out of bounds. Yeah, they are brutal, aren't they? But the worst is finally making it to the hole, only to find it's locked shut. So unfair. Affirmative. The game adds in the unusual feature of checkpoint locations that must be triggered before the hole is opened. The checkpoints do have rings of light above them, but even so, it's easy to miss one unless you scout around the hole as well. Mm, I ran into some trouble with them early on as well. Then I learned to keep an eye out for them during the course flybys. 
Plus, you can even send your pet bird out to scout around the hole if you've forgotten where the next one is. Yeah, there's certainly no shortage of tools to help you play. I sure took advantage of the limited rewind ability wherever I could, but even so, the levels just felt a little bit too big for me. I ended up caring less about mastering them and just rushing along to the hole. Negative. I adored the geometric precision that went into aiming the perfect shots. Calculating. Calculating. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed the calculations, Darren, but I'm with you on this one, Hex. The levels were way too complicated. Golf was meant to be fun. I was relieved when I found those more straightforward mini golf courses. I think they nailed that light-hearted mini golf tone. And because the courses are smaller, it's easy to get your head around how to tackle them. Yeah, suddenly I was getting par scores and actually having a really good time. Yeah, they were definitely the highlight for me too. What a shot. Nicely done, Marjo. Uh, the game does provide a handful of other modes as well. There's the driving range, but instead of simply hitting the ball as far as possible, they've spiced it up with all sorts of eggs to collect and ramps for trick shots. Oh, plus there's a race mode, which has more straightforward courses to speed through. Both of those modes felt a little bit gimmicky to me, unfortunately, but I was impressed to see that they've included the ability to build your own courses and download ones that the community have created. What are you giving it, Badge? Well, it's so nice to play a golf game that's more fantasy than simulation, because those simulation golf games were getting a little stale, and the mini golf alone made it for me. So I think this game is really, um, really good. I'm giving it three out of five stars. Uh, I'm giving it three out of five as well. Darren, you're in here. Oh, oh, what does it say? Uh, you're, there's a picture of you right next to Noob. Negative, oh! negative. Look up, Well, sadly, we're almost at the end of another show. But you know what that means, Darren? Affirmative. It's time for the answer to my challenge. <laughs> uh, earlier in the show, I asked you this. In LEGO Star Wars 3, The Clone Wars, what is the name of the Republic cruiser where you buy and spawn hero characters? And the answer is... The Resolute. There was a hub for the bad guys as well, and it was called the Invisible Hand. <laughs> oh, hey, speaking of spacecraft, a few weeks ago we reviewed affordable space adventures for the Wii U, and we asked you spawnlings to send us in pictures of your very own homemade spaceships, and we really love what we've seen so far. Oh, I like this one from Delaney. Great manipulation of the cardboard material there. Here we have the Bargain Blitzer from Jack and Lachlan. See how it resembles the R spawn point desk. Oh, lovely moustaches too. And there's this one from Oscar and Dante, who've constructed a very aerodynamic ship. Nice work, guys. And nice work from Olivia, too. I love the face window on your ship. Oh, and Lynette has made matching ships for her koala and kitty cat. Oh, 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 oh. oh and this one from Harry and Maya. Looks like you guys are ready to take off. And you brought breakfast with you. Lockie and Niall have the Teddy Transporter. Teddies make for great space companions. Oh, impressive work, Gus. I can only imagine it's top speed. Oh, oh, such creative crafting. Well done, Spallings. Yes, amazing work. Thank you so much for sending those in. Next week on the show, our blobby pink friend is back. It's Kirby with his magical rainbow paintbrush. And Darren, I think it's about time we wrapped up the Spawn Point League and got our prize that you've been getting together for us. Oh, you shouldn't be concerned with material rewards. A prize, Darren. Yeah. We won a prize. We, we won, won a prize. prize. Uh, next week, then. All will be revealed next week. <laughs> All right, well, until then, Bartu out. Hex out. Darren out. Oh, what's the prize made of? Yeah, is it a goat? Is it cheese? Is it ghost cheese? <gasps> well, Barjo, uh, how do you keep a noob in suspense? How? I'll tell you tomorrow. Oh, I see what you did there. Very <laughs> clever, Darren. <laughs> Tell me now. Negative. <laughs>